All right, good to see everybody here tonight. Welcome to the midweek service, 195. Take your songbook if you would. Let's start by singing 195, Down at the Cross Where My Savior Died. And let's sing it out and let the neighbors hear it tonight, all right? Let's stand together as we sing. Brother Bible, lead us. Down at the cross where my Savior died Down where for cleansing from sin I cried There to my heart was the blood applied Glory to His name Glory to His name Glory to His name There to my heart was the blood applied Saved from sin, Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where He took me in, glory to His name, glory to His name, glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood of. Sing that last together. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy first soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood. glad I'm saved, aren't you? And uh, it's good to sing glory to His name. When you're saved by grace through faith, all the glory goes to God because we don't deserve any of it. Amen. Good to see you in church tonight and a beautiful day. Boy, the last two days, we'll take some of that, won't we? And uh, good to see you here this evening and uh, looking forward to a good service together tonight. Let's open with prayer, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we bow before you in prayer here to start the beginning of the service and Lord, we thank you for the beautiful day that you've blessed us with, and we sure do enjoy the sunshine and the warmer weather. Lord, thank you, Lord, for the people who are faithful to be in church on a Wednesday night. And we pr trust, Lord, that you'll meet with us here as well this evening and fulfill the promise that when we gather together, there you are in the midst. And so, Lord, I pray that this wouldn't just be the ritual of a Wednesday night service, and uh, I pray you'd help our mind and our focus to be here. Uh, help us to give you our, our attention for these next hour, hour and 15 minutes that you might accomplish your will in each one of our lives. Lord, may your, you have your way in our service here this evening. Make it just what we need it to be and what you would desire it to be in our lives here on a Wednesday night. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. The children are going to sing for us, but I don't see any children. Uh, somebody want to check and see where they are? I guess we'll, uh, are they coming? Lisa, are you leading them? Lisa, are you playing for the Patch Club? Yes? Okay, good. That's a start. We got a piano player. Things are improving. And here they come. The first one looks a little old to be in the group. Oh, okay, she's not. All right. <laughs> don't get embarrassed i was gonna say you were the right height but i, I didn't say that all right and uh all right I was checking my edition 
wonderful day day i will never forget heaven came down and glory filled my soul two four nine we're going to sing all three stanzas of heaven came down and glory filled my soul on that first together oh what a wonderful wonderful day day i will never forget after i'd wandered in darkness away Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shed is the spelling with joy, I am telling. He made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Oh, and at the cross, the Savior.
updates from the Levine family, missionaries to Nepal. Hello, praying friends. We would like to ask you all for a special prayer for the country of Nepal. They just experienced a major earthquake of a 7.8 magnitude. The epicenter was located just west of Kathmandu, where our home and ministry is. The earthquake was also followed by over 65 aftershocks, some of them very powerful. There had been a report of nearly 4,500 people killed, but that number is still climbing and estimated to end up being over 10,000. Praise God, we have been able to confirm the safety of many of our loved ones and our church members. There are some major issues that are a cause for concern with the future of Nepal. One of those concerns is the lack of water and electricity. Vegetables are also running low already. Many houses have collapsed or have been deemed unsafe. Even our office where our church meets and where the translation is done has also been deemed unsafe as the entire back of the building's foundation is sinking down. There are also large cracks. The Knickerbocker's home is also has cracks and Luke will be looking for an alternate place for housing. We do not yet know the condition of our own home. Most of the people we know have been living outdoors due to safety concerns, so it has been very difficult. Looting is also a concern as homes may be open and exposed to those willing to risk their lives to steal other people's belongings. Luke's family will be returning to the U.S. in a few days, but he will be staying behind to assist others in this crisis and determining future plans. I was able to talk to Luke for a short, able to talk to Luke a short while ago, and was able to get a better idea about the situation there. There is also a huge risk of disease. The embassy was warning that there was an 80% chance of contracting the swine flu but was encouraging others to wear face masks. In order to continue to do work over there anytime soon, we need to evaluate our situation and make plans for our future. We need to assess the situation for our own family and for our church family. I am looking at traveling to Nepal in about 10 days or so. During my return, we are looking to establish future return plans for our family encouraging the brothers and sisters in Christ, reach out to the lost in such a critical time, and help the local people in need to the best of our ability. Uh, if you are interested in helping us directly, we could use your help. Some things that we are looking to need help for very soon, plane tickets, uh, travel will be subject to change as the airport is very busy, camping resources, um, he says it would be helpful if they could bring over a waterproof tent or water purifying equipment to provide at least a small portion of drinking water. A mountain bike, uh, because him and Luke will be traveling to various areas around KTM, and this will be the most flexible option of getting around. Portable communications equipment, says that they need to get some small equipment to use, like a small table or two, two-way radios, a solar charger, uh, would also be helpful as electricity is out in many places. Essential emergency medical resources and dried foods. 
says, I want to make note that anything that I do bring with me is highly subject to refusal on the direct flights to KTM. Our friends have just flown from Delhi to KTM, but their bags did not make it, as the plane brought over a large, amount, large amounts of aid. I will try to bring the most important essentials in a carry-on, but I still will only be allowed a maximum of check bags, most likely. Um, if you would like to help meet the needs of these expenses, please contact us as soon as possible as time is short to prepare. Um, we have had several people ask about sending relief money to the Nepali people. We do not know where we would send money ourselves yet, but we'll, we will be determining how we can assist in that way when I arrive. So far, so for the time being, we are also collecting money for relief for those who want to give to help those who had suffered because of the earthquake. The money will be collected by our mission board and will be used to the best of our knowledge to help the Nepali people. Please pray for Nepal, Philippines. I wanted to have that update from them. Uh, and as he, you heard there, Brother Knickerbocker is flying his wife and children home uh, for their safety, I think, over the next while. They, uh, many, many people are just staying outside. And of course, you know, with that, uh, with that many folks having lost their life and they're still uncovering bodies from the debris and such, uh, disease is a very real uh, thing and uh, especially for the children and everything they want to uh, have precautions and uh, bring them home um, so pray for that and uh, and then I thought too because uh, there's you know your hearts go out to people at that time and we want to try to give to to help in that need but you know rather than just give to some organizations where you don't know what's going to happen to the money I'd, I'd sure rather give to somebody who I know uh, how's it how's it going to be used, and it's going to get to the right uh, in the right way, and uh, so uh, we're going to take our offering tonight for that relief effort over in Nepal, and we'll we'll funnel it through the Levines and allow them to disperse it as they they feel needed uh, there in, on the ground when he gets there. Okay, and uh, so that's uh, why I wanted to make sure you have that update. Okay, prayer guide. Everybody have one. Anybody need one? Put your hand up, and uh, Brother Paul Abel will be right on it. Right over here, Miss Nicole uh, would like to have one. And uh, anybody else? Very good. All right. Uh, start with the coming events, if you would. And uh, the are you inside at the prison uh, tomorrow evening? As far as we know, that's a go. And so we're looking forward to getting back in there tomorrow evening. And then uh, Reformers Unanimous here uh, Friday night from 7 to 9. And a reminder for those of you involved with RU that it, it will not be in this room. It will be in the Fellowship Hall. All right. Uh, this room will be getting set up for the ladies uh, tea on uh, Saturday it will all the tables are already be set up and such so uh, and by the way that reminds me after the service tonight we need fellas to uh, get some chairs uh, taken care of in here and get it ready for uh, the tables to come tomorrow all right so please remind me of that at the end of the service okay and uh, but that'll be the RU Friday night ladies tea is Saturday 1130 and uh, my understanding is that it is full, so uh, there is no more reservations. If you're on the list, you're good. Uh, just pay, but if you're not on the list, uh, then you're out. You can be on a waiting list, I guess, if somebody uh, definitely says they're not going to come. Maybe we can squeeze you in, but it's reached the maximum, all right? And uh, so we appreciate that. And then we're starting the operation saturation. The flyers are down there. We officially will start Saturday. If you want to take a few with you tonight, that's fine. Sign them out and uh, begin to spread the word and uh, invite folks to come and uh, be present with us on uh, May the 16th Sunday night at five oh, by the way Sunday morning is picture day I forgot to say that uh, we'll gather like we usually do Lord willing out front and get a picture uh, with everybody that's here Sunday morning so uh, you know try to comb your hair and brush your teeth and look your best all right and uh, we get a good picture taken there on a Sunday all right that'll be right after the morning service and then Sunday evening at 5 55 we'll have an organizational meeting got a few little things a little different because of it being on a Saturday and uh, you understand just uh, where normally we run the fair for an hour and a half or so it's going to be four hours and so if everything's going to be just a little bit different and we'll talk about that and uh, uh, get your assignment on, on Sunday evening and uh, let you kind of know how it's going to roll all right be just a little different format than what we've had before okay and then of course uh, Mother's Day coming up on May the 10th now on the inside um, 
the praise reports for the good number on the bus route last Sunday and uh, looking forward to what the Lord's going to do on the route this week. Uh, the good news is the bus is almost ready for inspection. Uh, the problem is the highway patrol is not ready for us. Called today to get the bus inspected and uh, they just finished. They, they, what they do is they take two weeks every year to inspect all church buses. And it was the week of April 13 through uh, what would that be? 18, that sun, Monday through Friday, and then again from April 21 through April 20, 24, 25, whatever that was, Friday. And that's the two weeks. So in other words, the first week they inspect the buses. If someone fails, you reschedule a reinspection for the second week to see if you pass. If you don't pass that second week, then you don't, they don't start reinspections again till May 11th. So when I called today to say, well, you know, and, and by the way, several years ago, some of you might remember when we bought a bus, they sent two patrolmen out here, and they did the inspection right here. And I said, well, could you just send somebody out to the church? They said, we don't do that anymore. Uh, you have to bring the bus up here. And I said, well, if there's a cancellation between now and May 11th, he goes, no, you don't understand. We're not expecting any buses till May 11th. That's the earliest you can get this bus inspected. So we made an appointment for May 11th, all right? He said, well, what are we going to do the next two Sundays? We're, we're working at uh, finding a local company that we're going to rent a bus for two weeks. Uh, it's going to be expensive. It's probably going to be $200 a Sunday. And, uh, but we, we've got to, uh, I believe with all my heart, he'll hit 30 on that bus this Sunday. And, and if we're going we're gonna to get 50 or 60 kids in for the country fair, you're not going to do that from running 18 and then go to 60. You've got to build up to that, and so we, we it's something we just got to do. Uh, I have the first week taken care of. I got two individuals that are footing the bill for that. Uh, so if you, if God lays in your heart to help with that second week, that'd be great. But uh, it's uh, no matter what, we're going to do it. And by the way, that's not a bad thing. You know what? If if we're if Satan's pushing back that much, some good things are in store. All right. I've I've learned through the years that it's negative confirmation. When uh, things like that come out, buddy, you just push through because God's got something big going on, and uh, we're just going to keep after it, all right? Just uh, give him a black eye and say hey, we're, not, we're not stopping, all right? So uh, we'll, we'll do that, and that'll give these guys time. And uh, listen, they're going to be over that bus with a fine-tooth comb by May 11th, and uh, that, thing will, that thing will go through with flying colors, I'm sure, uh, by then. And so we, uh, we're looking forward to that. We did have a good meeting last Thursday with officials out at the London Correctional Facility, the London Prison, regarding Reformers Unanimous. And uh, we should be hearing something from them uh, soon about the, the schedule and the start date and uh, when we can start things there. Uh, but I'm pretty confident that probably sometime in May that uh, that's going to begin out there. It was so exciting to be able to go out there and meet with them and lay a sheet out in front of them that there's 12 men that had come through CRC that are now at London that have been doing the Reformers Unanimous program. And uh, so they, they know right away you got 12 guys that would show up. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's exciting to see. So uh, keep praying for that. Uh, that'll be another expansion of the RU Inside ministry. Okay? Keep praying for the church requests and the ministries and, of course, the health list here. Good to see Ronnie Ross back there tonight. And uh, glad he's here in church this evening. And uh, that's good to see. And... Um, uh, continue to pray for uh, Rose Hamner, Heather's grandma, and uh, she's got that, uh, now I know where Mary gets her spirit, and uh, everybody gets their determination, and uh, I mean, they were, they, they called the family in Friday will be, or this, almost three weeks ago now, wasn't it? I mean, she's, she's just tough, and uh, but keep praying for her and for God's grace to be on her. Good to see Jackie Van Gelder here, too. Praise the Lord. And uh, and remember to pray for Lindy McKeon. Uh, Lindy goes in tomorrow for a procedure and, uh, at 7 a.m. So if you just set your clock for that, uh, I know she would appreciate you praying for her uh, tomorrow morning. Okay? And praying for those in authority. Uh, our, our leaders certainly need that. Praying for these who are battling cancer. Praying for these who need to be saved and uh, loved ones and friends on our salvation list and be praying that God will bring someone in their life who they'll listen to or give them the gospel. And then praying for those in our military. And then, of course, our missionaries highlighted tonight by both the Knickerbockers and the Levines who are serving there in Nepal uh, with the earthquake devastation that they've had. 
one, right? We're going to go to prayer tonight. It's good to have Brother Moreland in town, and I wanted him to come and lead us in our prayer this evening. And uh, Brett, you want to add something? Jennifer and uh, it's a bus family and they were in an accident. Everybody was okay yeah. but the uh, van is pretty well ruined and uh, but let's let's keep praying for God to work in that family. Brother Morland you come would you please and we're going to have you lead us in our prayer this evening and uh, let's pray together with Brother Morland as he leads us audibly. Pray along with him silently. Would you do that please? Thank you. Brother Ron. Our gracious Heavenly Father, it's an honor to come before your throne this evening, Lord, and be in your house. Lord, I ask that tonight, Lord, you'll be with those that are in Nepal and um, through all this devastation and those souls that have been lost. And uh, Lord, some souls have come home and some have been lost in eternity. And Lord, we just ask that you'll be with Luke, Lord, as he's over there and he's working. And Lord, I've noticed that um, he says there's many doors that he's been able to... Um, that have been open to share the gospel, Lord, and we just ask that you'll work in those, through those doors and through Luke in a mighty way. Lord, we also ask you to be with Justin as he's getting ready to um, go back over and, and look at the work and look to see what's going on, Lord. Uh, Lord, this is right in the center of the 1040 window, and Lord, we just need to be able to stay there, keep those boots on the ground, and keep that work going. And, Lord, uh, we know that Satan wants to fight in every way. And, Lord, there's that, that Bible translation going on. And we know that there's more languages they've been looking at. Lord, we just ask that you'll keep those doors open, that we can get in there and that we can still have a work that to, to be done. Lord, and for those that are helping in that work, Lord, we just ask that you'll open up hearts and keep things flowing that way. Um, Lord, there's so many here that... Um, I just have health problems, and Lord, we just thank you for Brother Ross being here tonight with us, and um, Lord, we just ask you to be with the, the Barham family as they're um, with Miss Rose as she's um, departing, getting ready to come home, and Lord, we just ask that you be with them and um, prepare their hearts for that. Lord, we ask that you'll just be with these that are having health issues, Lord, that they'll find uh, who you are, and through every trial and tribulation, Lord, you'll give us gifts, and Lord, we just ask that you'll give the doctors understanding, give those understanding too, Lord. And if they don't know who you are as Lord and Savior, Lord, we just ask that you'll, they have a chance to know who you are and that they can hear that gospel. Lord, we just thank you for a chance that we can um, have this bus. Lord, what an honor and, and a privilege it is to be able to have a bus ministry, to be able to go out into the highways and to the hedges and bring those in to hear your word. And Lord, we just ask that you'll work in a mighty way that... Um, that this bus, when it is inspected on May 11th, Lord, that uh, it'll pass, and Lord, that we can get out right away, and Lord, as uh, we're trying to bring a bus in for, and get ready for the, the special Saturday, Lord, the country fair, Lord, first of all, bring those that, that you want here, that you want to hear the gospel, Lord, please let everything go according to your will, and Lord, those that have never heard, Lord, that they get a chance, see who you are, Lord, and they'll accept you as Savior. Lord, and I just uh, thank you for all those who are participating in that and who are working hard and diligently to put out flyers and, and so forth. Lord, I also want to just thank you for um, all the members of this church and who are here and they've dedicated their lives to, and their free time, Lord, just to serve you. Lord, I just ask that you put a hedge around them and guide them and protect them and keep them healthy. Lord, um, just... Uh, Thank you so much for the, the meeting there in, in London with the RU program. And, Lord, what a wonderful ministry that is. I just ask that you'll work in a mighty way through that. Um, continue to work in the Orient. Continue to work here on Friday nights, Lord. And then, uh, Lord, if there's an open door there in London, you'll do that as well. Lord, we pray for our uh, government, for our officials there, Lord, that you've put them in our way. 
And Lord, for those that have never heard your word, Lord, um, and need your salvation. Lord, now I just ask that you'll be with this church service tonight. Lord, I ask that you'll be with Pastor as he speaks your word. Open up our hearts and our minds, Lord, that the way we came in, that we won't, we won't leave the way we came in, but we'll leave changed, and we'll be better servants for you. Lord, we just thank you for everything. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Two hundred nine in your hymnal. Two zero nine. Like a river, glorious is God's perfect peace. As you find that, would you stand with me? We'll sing that first together. Like a river, glorious. Like a river, glorious is God's perfect peace. And greet one another. Make somebody feel welcome. We'll come back and sing those last stanzas together. from above. Let's sing that last together as you find your seats. Every joy or trial Him holy, find him holy. 
seated now the ushers come get our offering tonight and uh, again we'll take this to give for the relief effort there in nepal and we'll ask god to bless and multiply our gift that it'll be uh, used for the for the help and really for the reaching of the gospel uh with the people there during this time and uh you know there's God has a purpose for this, and um, we want to pray, and pray for wisdom for those involved in ministry there as to what the Lord would have them to do, and that they would uh, seek His perfect will in this matter. All right? Brother Paul Abel, I want you to pray for us tonight, if you would, please. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, day that you've given us here, and we Pray for those in Nepal that you would give them the wisdom that they will know exactly what to do and when to do it. And we know that you're bigger than any any earthquake or anything else else that happens. And we just pray that you that they see Jesus through you. And we just pray that you uh, bless this offering that we're giving tonight. And may we give cheerful givers and be able to send us out to them. We ask that you bless the service tonight with the priest preacher. And bless the word that he puts out tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Take your Bible this evening. Let's go to Matthew chapter 12. Will you please? Matthew chapter 12. We are last Wednesday night on the gospel. And uh, our theme for April has been the gospel. And uh, each month, as you know, we've had a, along with the theme for the year of Give God Glory for 60 years. In January, we focused on stewardship. In February was I Love, Love, and Love My Church Month. And then, of course, uh, March was prayer. And now April is the gospel. Uh, May will be the Great Commission. It goes along with the country fair and uh, the Great Commission. And so we'll be talking about that as we get into the month of May. But tonight, I want to talk to you specifically about the gospel and the unpardonable sin. There's a lot of uh, misconception about what the unpardonable sin is. And uh, what just exactly what does that mean? And so we'll be able to look at that this evening. Pick up in Matthew chapter 12 and uh, look with me, if you would, please. Uh, beginning in verse number 22. Then was brought unto him, that's Jesus, one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb. And he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts, and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. 
Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man? And then he will spoil his house. He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Father, add your blessing to the reading of the Scripture now this evening. And Father, we ask for your help as we come to this particular study, the gospel and what is called the unpardonable sin. And I pray, Holy Spirit, you'd be our teacher this evening. Speak to the hearts of those who are listening and speak to my heart as I teach. Help us to have understanding as to exactly what the truth is that you would take to our hearts this evening. And I pray we would understand better who you are and what you do in our life and what someone can do that would sin against you. And so, Father, guide us and lead us in this study this evening. Give us understanding according to your word. And I'll thank you for it. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Now, there are many sins, or there are several sins, I guess we could say, that we can commit against the Holy Spirit of God that the Bible talks about. The one we're going to focus on, we're going to talk about a couple of them tonight, but the main one we'll, we'll focus on to begin with is what's called the unpardonable sin. And while it is, the unpardonable sin is the unforgivable sin, it's a sin that Jesus says would not be forgiven man if he commits it. It's extremely serious, it's a desperately dangerous sin, but I'll say this, it's also easily avoidable doesn't have to be committed. You know, some churches worship God the Father only. They do not recognize Jesus as God. There's other churches that just want to worship Jesus. They don't want to talk about the Father or the Spirit. And others are all about the Spirit and they don't talk much about Father and the Son. But as the Young people saying this evening, he's three in one. And he's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That was their teaching this past month, was all about the Trinity. And that he's God in three persons. And uh, oftentimes what we have done in many Baptist churches is because of sometimes some, some overemphasis, some groups overemphasize or talk only about the Spirit, and the gifts of the Spirit and, and the, the, the other things about the Spirit, we've kind of shied away and uh, tragically we don't talk enough about the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit can do in each one of our lives. I don't place the Holy Spirit in the spotlight. That isn't what He wants anyway. He's here to exalt Christ and He's here to promote Jesus Christ. But we have to understand who the Holy Spirit is and that part of the Godhead to be able to live for Christ as we ought to live for Christ. Charles Spurgeon said this, Common, too common, is the sin of forgetting the Holy Spirit. And by the way, he wrote that in the 1800s. He says, The church will never prosper until it more reverently it believes in the Holy Ghost of God. So we have to understand the Spirit of God and His presence in our life and, and how we can become submissive to His leadership. Part of what the, the Reformers Unanimous program is, is, deals with and what we focus a lot on, a lot of the curriculum is simply living a Spirit-controlled life. You memorize the fruit of the Spirit and understand what it is to yield to the Spirit of God and and, and react, don't react in the flesh, but to react with the Spirit. And we have to understand what the Spirit of God does. When you get saved, 
the Spirit of God takes up residence in your body. Whether you knew it or not, whether you realized it or not, you said, well, I just asked Jesus to save me. That's fine, and that's what you do. You don't ask the Holy Spirit to come in. He automatically comes in when you receive Christ. Romans chapter 8 and verse 9 says, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you're not a born-again believer. If you're a born-again believer, if your faith is in Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit of God. He indwells you. And He is able to do incredible things through you and me if we'll yield to Him. That's the key you'll find out as we go through our lesson here this evening. But first I want to talk about this uh, unpardonable sin and what's referred to has the unpardonable sin. Just what is the unpardonable sin that Jesus mentions here? And it is, number one, it is simply rejecting the Spirit of God. Now, I'll give a little more detail about that and explain what that means. Christ, as you read in our, what we just read here in the passage, had just performed a miracle. He had healed a man who was demon-possessed, and uh, those who witnessed this responded in two different ways. Some saw it as proof that Christ was the Messiah. All the people, verse 23, all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? Is it, this is the one that was David prophesied about. This is the promised one. And they believed that. But others accused Jesus of casting out Demons, verse 24, by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. So others accuse Jesus of literally being a subordinate of the devil himself. That's how he was able to cast out this demon. Christ reminds them the inconsistency of their claim when he said, if a kingdom's divided against itself, it can't stand. And if Satan's divided against himself, he can't stand. And he said uh, that you can't speak against the Holy Spirit of God. He said, if I, by the Spirit of God, verse 28, cast out devils, then the kingdom of God is coming to you. Now, he says an amazing statement in verse number 31. Notice what Jesus said. Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. That's an amazing statement. All manner of sin and blasphemy will be forgiven. Sometimes people identify certain sins. I was listening to one of the old time radio programs and they were talking about one individual who was contemplating suicide but he was afraid because that's one of the mortal sins I'm not real familiar with that phraseology I think it's from Catholicism they have mortal sins or in other words I think those are sins that you don't get forgiven for a lot of people think suicide's the unforgivable sin but suicide's not forgiven it's not an unforgivable sin the Lord said here all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. That would include that sin. All manner of sin is forgivable. No matter the heinous, listen, the murderer, the, 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 the heinous dictator, the one, the, the, whether it's Hitler or Mussolini or Saddam Hussein, if they turn to Christ and would ask Christ to save them from their sin, they could be saved. God can forgive all manner of sin and blasphemy. They could even, listen, they could even talk against Christ and be forgiven. And by the way, some of you, that was your case. Before you became a Christian, you spoke against Christ. You took His name in vain. You may have made fun of God's people. But God forgave you. And God saved you. You're a living testimony to that truth that Jesus gave. Now understand, no sin is ever forgiven unless it's asked for. If we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
So we do have to ask forgiveness. But the point that Jesus makes here is that resisting the Holy Spirit of God, going against the Holy Spirit of God, there is no forgiveness for that. Jesus didn't describe what these people had done. He did describe what they're in danger of doing. What they're in danger of doing was rejecting the witness of His Word. They're in danger of rejecting the witness of His work. They saw the miracle that He did. But I don't think they had yet rejected the final witness, and that is the witness of the Holy Spirit of God. The only unforgivable sin is when you reject the witness of the Spirit of God and you refuse to accept Christ as your Savior. That sin is unforgivable. If God would forgive the sin of rejecting the Spirit of God and receiving Christ your Savior, if God would forgive that sin, everybody would go to heaven no one would go to hell. It's simply rejecting Christ and not receiving Him as your Savior. Listen carefully. See, nobody comes under Christ unless the Spirit of God brings him to Christ. It, you, the, reason, the reason when you heard the gospel... Whenever, whatever time it is, and you decided, or there was something in you, whether it's at church, whether it's home, whether someone was witnessing to you, and, and inside your heart you said, man, I'm going to believe this, I'm going to get saved. That's because the Spirit of God brought you that decision. You didn't come on that on your own. Not of yourselves. It was the Spirit of God drawing you to Him, and you received Christ as your Savior. In the Old Testament, God gave the witness to men through miracles and through his prophets. God had prophets that he'd raise up who would speak to people the word of the Lord and then miracles that they would perform, Elijah and Elisha and others. During the days of Christ on this earth, Jesus was the witness. He came to show the world the gospel. But today, in the church age, the Holy Spirit of God is the witness to the heart of man. He bears witness to Christ. Look at, uh, here in Matthew, uh, turn over to John chapter 15. Look at John 15. John 15, notice it with me, verse number 26. Here's what he said, But when the Comforter is come whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, what will He do? He shall what? He'll testify of me. What's the Spirit of God doing in this day? Testifying of Christ. Testifying of Jesus Christ. And, and by the way, where is the Holy Spirit of God? He's in us, isn't He? So if he's going to be testifying to others of Christ, how's he going to do it? Through you and me. That's how he does it. The reason you don't witness is you don't listen to the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God will testify to others of Christ. If we're yielded to him, we will be witnesses. You see, what the Spirit of God does, you're in chapter 15, look at John 16. Again, Jesus talking about the Comforter that will come. That's the Holy Spirit. Notice verse number 7. Nevertheless, I tell you this, the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, here's what he's going to do. He'll reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. He's going to convict men. Notice he convicts the world. He's going to reprove the world. That's the lost. He's going to reprove them of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. You know, convicts 
the lost person that they're a sinner who needs a Savior? That's the Spirit of God. He convicts men of their lost condition. And He is God's final call to the individual. And every time a person rejects the witness of the Holy Spirit, he moves one step closer to eternal judgment and condemnation. You've heard me say it before to people when they're in service on a Sunday or whatever that they may have other opportunities to get saved, but I know they'll never have a better opportunity than what they have right now. I don't know if they'll have another opportunity. They may, but they may not. You know, it was pretty terrifying. I, I saw a, a picture of uh, those who were at one of the base camps on Mount Everest. I don't know if any of you picked up any of those. There's a YouTube video of somebody at that camp and how little notice they had. I mean, they heard the rumbling, and boy, you looked up, and you just saw this wall of white and rock coming down, and this fellow left his camera run through it. They were obviously some that survived it. But I forget how many on that base, 19 of them or whatever, uh, went into eternity. Hey, they didn't get up that day thinking, this will be my last day on earth. They didn't know that I'll never have another opportunity to be saved. There were some Americans in that group, and I'm sure that they had opportunity to hear the gospel. We certainly have a whosoever will gospel. And whosoever will may come. And whosoever can be saved. And, and through the preaching of the Word of God and the witness of other believers, the Holy Spirit convinces people they need to be saved. He'll call all who will listen. And He'll save all who choose to receive the gift of salvation. And let me just say that I, I agree with what Dwight Moody said years ago. That the, all the elect are the whosoever wills and the non-elect are the whosoever wants. Whosoever will may come. God's patient and long-suffering, but I tell you, there can, be a t there, there can come a time when your time is up. Lord gives an interesting statement in the Old Testament when He says, My spirit will not always strive with man. There comes a time when God will say, That's it. And that's a, that's a dangerous place to get to. Sometimes, you know, people wonder that if, you know, they, they sit in church and they, they hear the gospel and they're playing church, they're not really saved. And they think, yeah, but you know what? When, if, if Christ really comes back and there's a rapture and all these people disappear, I'll know what's going on and, man, I'll be the first one to fall on my knees and ask Christ to save me. I'm not sure you will. You will. You, you, you have to understand, you, you, can, you can feel that way now, but when the Spirit of God is through dealing with you, you won't feel that way. Couldn't help but think of that passage in Revelation during the tribulation period when the rocks and the, the earthquakes and the mountain, the things are falling on people, and, and yet they will not repent. They will not turn to God. You see, when the Spirit of God leaves you alone, my friend, you're, you won't turn to God. You'll get, you'll get more defiant at God. You'll be just like the devil himself. And you'll just continue to rebel against God. And that Holy Spirit won't pass your way ever again. You'll die in your sin. And when you die in your sin, having resisted, uh, resisted and resisted the Holy Spirit of God, there is no pardon for you. And you will die and go to hell, having committed the unpardonable sin that of rejecting the Spirit drawing you to Jesus Christ and saying, no, I will not do that. And by the way, you can, you can do that in many ways, not just that you won't get saved. There are people who just say, I don't believe that. So you don't believe the Bible. That's a bunch of stories. That's written by man. I think it was somebody, was it Brother Moreland talking to me this week? He was talking to someone who said, that, oh, there's you know, mistakes in the King James Bible. You don't need to do the King James Bible. I said, Ron said, well, go ahead and tell me, tell me some of them. In fact, he said, tell me one of them. And of course, crickets, you know, you don't hear anything. He's just, he's just repeating what he heard somebody say. They don't know, can't, can't give you anything. But you understand, when, you, when, when people get that way and don't want anything to do with the, the Word of God and with the Bible, you can, they're in dangerous ground of the Holy Spirit saying, I'm, I'm done. 
I'm done drawing you, and that would be an unpardonable sin. Now, believing that most of us in the room tonight on Wednesday night are saved and indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, what about us? By the way, let me ask you a question then. Knowing that that unpardonable sin is when someone rejects the Spirit of God and refuses any offer to receive Christ, then they'll die in their sins and they'll go to hell. That's the unpardonable sin. So can a Christian commit an unpardonable sin? No, because you're already saved. You've received Christ's gift. Now, can a Christian sin against the Holy Spirit? Yes, you can. Well, what, what are some sins that a Christian can do against the Spirit of God? Well, look at Ephesians chapter 4. Would you go there, please? Ephesians chapter 4. Notice with me verse number 30. Would you look there? Ephesians 4 and verse 30. Familiar verse to us probably. The Bible says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So the first thing we see here, what, what is sin we can do against the Holy Spirit? Grieve the Holy Spirit. Now I want you to notice that before we talk about grieving Him, we're sealed with the Spirit of God. The salvation of a believer is secure and eternal because the Holy Spirit of God has sealed us. And He's sealed until our redemption is complete. And that's when Christ comes back. And so it, He's got that seal that cannot be broken. The seal of God is the Spirit of God within us. And the Spirit of God, He's there and He never leaves. He's God's seal that we belong to Him. The Holy Spirit imparts our salvation and He sustains our salvation. He secures our soul until the day of redemption when He delivers us into the presence of God. See, the Holy Spirit's your lifelong companion, whether you realize it or not. He's with you for the duration. He comes in at salvation, takes up residence in His body. That's why He says we're the temple of the Holy Ghost. He goes where we go, joins in every activity we join into, listens to our every word, knows our every thought, sees everything that we see, and He's sensitive. The Holy Spirit's very sensitive. That's why He's grieved. He's the Holy Spirit. Holy speaks of His character. He is absolutely without sin. He's God, the Holy Spirit. It's against His very nature to sin. And therefore, sin in any form, in any way, is very disgusting to Him. Detestable to Him. He's the Holy Spirit. And by the way, He's not... Can I help you with something? What we call sometimes conviction of sin for a believer isn't really conviction. It's grieved. The Holy Spirit is grieved in us. And that's why we feel the way we do when we do something wrong. We say something we shouldn't say. We view something we shouldn't view. And boy, you get that feeling in the pit of your stomach. And you know, I grieve the Spirit of God today. And, and you know that He's sensitive to that. The Spirit of God speaks where He came from. He was sent from God. He is God. He's not of the world, and He's not part of the present world. And so he, he grieves, listen, he grieves when we sin or we become friendly with this world. Over in the book of James, it said that the spirit that dwells in us lusteth to the point of envy, lusteth to envy. He gets envious. He desires to the point of being envious. What would the Spirit of God be envious of? at the things that we allow to influence us 
and we won't let him influence us. The things that we do for other people, we let them influence us and we won't let him influence us. He's envious at what we allow other things and other people to control us. We won't let him control us. He says, oh, I wish I had that kind of influence. I wish he would be yielded to me like he's yielded to that or she's yielded to him or her. He gets envious. He's grieved when that happens. You see, all of the previous verses in Ephesians 4, going all the way back up to verse 22, where he says, You put off concerning the former conversation the old man, and get renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new man, verse 24, which is after God created unrighteousness and true holiness. And then he says, here's some characteristics. Notice what he says. Once we get saved and we're living a life yielded to the Spirit of God, notice what happens. We're going to be characterized by some things. We're going to be characterized by honesty. Look at verse 25. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we're members one of another. He says, you're going to be honest. You're, you're not going to lie. The world, the world seems to think that, oh, a little lie is okay. No, any lie is a lie. There's no white lie, big lie, little lie. A lie is a lie. And it's dirty, it's black, it's sinful. And now God says, when you get saved and you put that new man on and you're going to walk in holiness, in the Holy Spirit, you're going to be honest. And so we have honesty. But then he says in verse number 26, Be angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. He reminds us in verse 32, we're going to be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. So we're going to be forgiving. We're not going to let the sun go down on our wrath. If something has upset you and something has made you angry, you want to take care of that before the sun goes down. If you don't, what does verse 27 say? You're giving place to the devil. You're, you're allowing that to stay in your heart. And you're not taking care of it. And therefore, the devil's going to use that. And he thought it was bad at night. Wait till you wake up the next morning. You'll really be upset. You can't give the devil a foothold. And so, what do, we, what do we have? What's our characteristic? We're going to be honest. We're going to have a forgiving attitude, a forgiving spirit. We're going to be unselfish. Look at verse 28. Unselfish. Let him that stole steal no more but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. We're going to be unselfish. By the way, we, we, we don't... Might have stole before we got saved, but once we're saved, we're not stealing anymore. Let him that stole steal no more. By the way, that's not just necessarily physically taking something that doesn't belong to you, but hey, don't steal time from your employer. It's time to work, work. Don't, don't pass out a track and witness to somebody when you're supposed to be and paid to work. You do it on your time. Do it, do it when the, after, the, after you've clocked out and it's your time. He's not paying you to talk to someone about Jesus. He's paying you to work. So, and if you don't, you're stealing his time. You're stealing his money. And don't do that. But he goes on to say, not only that, but you're supposed to labor working with his hands a thing which is good, that you may get more things and have to rent a storage place to store it all. Oh, that's not what it says. You may have a bigger house and nicer things. No. You, you work that, that thing which is good that you may what? Have to give to them that need it. That's why we labor. Why? Unselfish. We're not here to collect the most stuff. You know, he who has the most stuff wins. No, he has the most toys or whatever that bumper sticker said. No, that's not a Christian saying. That's not in the Bible. Jesus said, A man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things he possesses. I thought about the Levines. How would you like to... I mean, it was it frightening enough. And uh, uh, Mrs. Knickerbocker, what's her first name? Jamie. She, she's been writing a blog. It's a Facebook. If you go on Facebook, just type her name in there, Jamie Knickerbocker, and you'll find her. And uh, you can read 
she's kind of been talking about what it was like, and especially her children. Her children have some real fears. I mean, they, they've been through a, a, a real ordeal. And, and she's just describing what, what life is like in the earthquake. And that, that's, that's, that's awful. I thought about Levine's. How would you like to be over here and an earthquake and your belongings are all over there in your home? And you don't know what it is. You don't even know if you're going to be there when you get back. It brings home to you again the truth. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. I mean, how would you feel tonight if you drove up to your house after church and the fire trucks are there and the hoses are on and your house is burning the ground? Yeah, you've been there. It's gone. It's gone. You realize, you know what? It's just stuff. We're not taking any of it with us anyway. And we, gotta, it, we have to be careful because we get attached to that stuff. We get attached to things. God says we have to continue to, to, to be marked by an unselfishness. We're not working. Those of us who, who work in our labor, we're not working to hold it on to and get a, get a tighter fist and to, to just store it up. We're, we're getting it so we can give. We can give. You say, well, but who's going to take care of me? God says you give to the poor you lend it to God. And that which you've given, He'll repay you again. Good enough for me. Good enough for me right there. That's God's promise. So we're marked by unselfishness. We're also marked by encouragement. Verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. We're marked by encouragement. That which good use to the edifying is that which builds up. The corrupt communication is that which tears somebody down. You never get yourself any bigger by making someone else look smaller. You never make yourself look better by making someone else look bad. Be encouraging. Build somebody up with your words. And give, have an encouraging spirit about yourself. And by the way, that comes from the Spirit of God being yielded to Him. He will give you that ability to be honest, to, to be forgiving, to be able to uh, be unselfish, to be able to be encouraging. That's the Spirit of God. And when that happens, it transforms your life. People look at you and say, man, you're not the same person you used to be. Thank you. I'm not. I'm not. Now, if he's grieved when we sin or we yield to temptation or we go after the be a friend of the world, wait a minute, when we yield to him and we allow him to control us, I think the opposite's true. He rejoices. And you have the joy in the Holy Ghost, the Bible talks about. That's where you want to live. That's where you want to be. He rejoices when we submit to Him. Now there's something else. Go to your right from, from Ephesians. Go past Philippians and Colossians and go to 1 Thessalonians and look at chapter 5. Would you please? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Here's, here's the other sin that we can commit against the Spirit of God. Just four short words in verse 19. Let's read them together. You ready? Verse 19, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. What are they? Quench not the Spirit. Say it again with me. Quench not the Spirit. There it is. That's not a suggestion. That's a command to be obeyed. Quench not the Spirit. The word quench means to extinguish. It was really used to put out a fire. To, to stifle something. When used of a person, it means you obstruct or you stifle them. And again, this is, this is in a string of commands and not necessarily just individually or singly when you're by yourself, but it, it literally has to do with when we gather together in public worship or a public church service. Just a string of commands that... that uh, things ought to be present when we gather together. 
Notice, notice here again in the context of what we're looking at. Starting up at verse 16. It says two words. What are they? Rejoice evermore. Rejoice evermore. Did you know when you come together to church, when you come to church, you ought to have an attitude of rejoicing? Huh? You ought to come and say, man, I'm glad it's church. It's Wednesday. It's church night. We're going to church. I, I never have understood people say, oh, man, I missed church last night. I forgot what day it was. Are you kidding me? Man, I look forward to Wednesdays. I don't wake up, but I say, man, it's Wednesdays church tonight. And, and I, you, listen, I, I'd like it better if you showed up on Tuesday night and said, where is everybody? I thought today was Wednesday. Funny how that never happens, but the other does. But you ought to come rejoicing. The, the per, listen, the, the person of God, the presence of Christ, He promised to be here. Man, I'm rejoicing. I get to be with God's people. I get to open up God's Word. We get to sing the songs of God together. Man, we ought to come with the spirit of rejoicing. It ought to be a habit of prevailing prayer. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. Jesus said, my house will be called a house of prayer. It's biblical to pray when you come to church. And to have prayer in church. The, the, the way you demonstrate to the world the reality of God is to have answered prayer. To be able to have some things that they look at and think, man, there's no answer to that except God. God answers prayer. And they come to realize that there's a God in heaven who hears and answers prayer. So we come to church and we share prayer requests, we share our praises and share answers to prayer. That's what it should be like. And by the way, an unsaved person comes in, they ought to hear that. They shouldn't just see the prayer list, they ought to hear answers to prayer. They ought to know that God hears and answers prayer. There should be a habit of gratitude. Verse 18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. It's God's, word, it's God's will that we express thanksgiving or thanks in everything. In everything give thanks. So often we just focus on everything that's wrong and we don't focus on what's right. And don't just focus on the wrong. Don't just focus on what's bad. Focus. Uh, um, um, uh, don't, don't focus on what you don't have. Focus on what you do have. And thank God for what you have. Contentment is wanting what you already have. That's contentment. I was telling somebody, uh, in fact, I, I think it's a radio program coming up. I don't know when it, when it is, but it's coming up. And, you know, I, I was reading that the, the average supermarket in 1976 had 9,000 items in it. The average supermarket in, 19, or in 2014, I think it was, had over 30,000 items in it. Nearly three and, three and a third times more items. Do we really need 30,000 items? Huh? Isn't that amazing? What am? We're, we're not content. You walk in, there's only 9,000 items in the store. You'd say, where is everything? Huh? And, and we, it, the, the, the advertising is, is bent on getting us to be discontent with what we have. We have to learn contentment, as Paul told us. And learn, by the way, that starts with being grateful. Be grateful for what you have. Quit focusing on what you don't have. What did the devil do to Eve? Don't focus on all the trees you can't eat of. Focus on the one you can't have. That's what He still does for us. Gets us to focus on the one thing that isn't going well or the one thing we don't have that's good and just get consumed with that and forget about all the good things that God's done. He hasn't changed. So in everything, give thanks. Make it a habit to be thankful. There should be a habit of Bible study. Notice what it says in, in listening to preaching. He said, despise not prophesying in verse 20. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. I think that proving follows that despise not prophesying. I think it goes with what we said Sunday. You hear the preaching, but then you better prove it. Check it out. Make sure it's true to the Scripture. 
If you have a question, you come and talk to the pastor and say, you know, hey, help me understand this. Explain this to me. And, and, and I'm, I'm thankful to do that. Man, I'll, I'll talk Bible with you anytime you want to talk Bible. I'll talk Bible, drop the hat, and I'll drop the hat. Uh, just, 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 you know, I, I'm happy to do that. And that's what it ought to be when we come together to church. By the way, it ought to be because you have a, your own personal time with God. Don't live on the church services. Don't just live on that. That ought to just be a help to you, an encouragement to you. But you need that daily time alone with God. You need that. Everybody needs that. There has to be separation. That's part of coming together too. Look at verse 22. What's it say? Abstain from all appearance of evil. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Moral, social, doctrinal separation. It's there. It's all in the context of, of, of gathering together. Coming together. That's why, that's why a church doesn't bring the world in. Church is a called out assembly. Has to be separate. This is for God. Not, not for us. We're not seeker sensitive. We're savior sensitive. Sensitive to what the savior wants and what God wants. See, the Holy Spirit didn't come to be a spectator in church. He came to be in charge. He came to work in the church. And He's quenched when we don't seek His leadership. He's quenched when we substitute programs for His leadership and genuine worship. He's quenched when rejoicing is absent, when prayer is absent, when when gratefulness is absent, when truth is ignored and compromise is tolerated, that quenches the Spirit of God. Now, all of this on the Holy Spirit gets us to realize something. The primary responsibility of man in his relationship with the Holy Spirit is yieldedness. Am I yielded to the Holy Spirit? It can't be my way and the Spirit's way. Okay? It's got to be His way. If it's my way, it's not His way. And if it's His way, it's not my way. I have to yield to Him. The lost person needs to respond to the Spirit's conviction and receive Christ as a Savior. But the saved person needs to submit to the life-changing power of the Holy Spirit of God. The church needs to seek the Spirit of God's leadership and then follow. My brother-in-law was considering a position at a church in the Northeast. And it was a position where it was a larger church and it was kind of an administrative type position on the pastoral staff and he'd be working with someone who they had on there who was kind of like the treasurer. And he, but after he talked with the pastor and things were very good and it looked promising and they were planning maybe taking a trip up there and, and then he talked with the fellow he'd be working with. And he called my wife and talked to her and he said, I don't think it's going to, don't think it's what the Lord wants. He said, we have too differing of a view on the way the church ought to operate. He said, this fella is strictly business, and he wants to run the church just as a business. He said, and while the church is a business, the church also has to operate by faith, and the church has to operate being led by the Spirit of God. And it's a whole different entity than just somebody who's running a business with, with no thought of what God wants. You have to seek the Spirit's leadership. And there's times, I'm going to tell you, there's times it doesn't, there's times you do things that wouldn't make sense to someone who's just looking at it from a business standpoint. When you, when you sometimes when you have a need, like, like we have, sometimes, you know it, we've had needs before and we've taken offering for some other need and sent the money away. So why would you do that when you need it? Because if we give, It'll be given unto us. 
That's just the Bible principle. See, that's not the business principle. No, but it's the Bible principle, and we're a church. And we have, we, I can't, listen, the church can't tell the people, and I know the people are the church, but you understand, they can't tell the people live by faith, and then the church operate by sight. The church has to lead the way. Be obedient to the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is the greatest force of change present in the world today. But He's not going to be able to do anything without our willing cooperation and submission. We have to submit. We have to yield. Listen. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly, above all we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. That power that's at work in us is the Holy Spirit of God. We think God can do great things. God can do exceeding abundantly. God's going to do it through you and through me what he said how come that doesn't happen how yielded are you how submitted are you when you're submitted and you're yielded unbelievable things can be done miraculous things can be done if we're yielded to the spirit of God let's stand together and we'll have prayer All right, father thank you for this evening thank you for everyone's attention tonight thank you lord for the word of God thank you holy spirit of God for being the comforter for indwelling each of us as believers and in wanting to empower us to live as you would want us to live. Forgive us, Lord, for oftentimes allowing other things to influence us more than we let the Spirit of God influence us. Forgive us for times where I'm sure we've grieved the Spirit and we've quenched the Spirit. Oh, I pray you'd help us to yield ourselves to the Spirit of God. That we might live Spirit-controlled, Spirit-filled lives for your honor and glory. Father, we pray your blessing on each individual as they leave this place tonight. Help us to be doers of the Word and not hearers only. Use us to point other people to Jesus this week. Father, if you tarry your coming, give us a good Lord's Day. Bless the RU tomorrow and Friday and the ladies' tea on Saturday, the flyers as they begin to go out. God, help us to impact our community for Jesus Christ on May 16th. We're asking you to give us many, many souls to be saved that day. Gospel given, decisions made for Jesus. May you provide what we need, Lord, for the bus and provide what we need for that special day. Lord, I pray that you'd help each of us to have an excitement in our heart about what you could do through us in the month of May. Dismiss us now with your care, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's sing together. Isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? Hey, isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? Eyes have seen, ears have heard, it's recorded in God's Word. Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? All right, God bless you. You're dismissed. Uh, who's staying to do the chairs? Who's going to help?